Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is February the 4th in the year of our Lord, 2018, and this is One a Day for the Soul. Now, we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and today we're going to begin the book of Exodus. But before we do, and in order to understand what is taking place, we need to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. Now, God has just promised Abraham that he is going to have a promised seed. And from that seed, many nations will come. And it says in verse 6 that Abraham believed in the Lord. He counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto Abram, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And in verse 12, it says, Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. Now notice, he's just been given a promise that many nations are going to come from his seed. But there's some darkness that is going to accompany that seed. And in verse 13, he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. That's what we're going to see in today's lesson and moving forward as we begin the book of Exodus. The people of God, the chosen people, are going to be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. And they will serve these people. And they will afflict them for 400 years. Now, as we have seen in the book of Genesis, as it came to a close, the people have moved to Egypt. And right now they're under the favor and the blessing and the goodness of Egypt because of the relationship that Joseph had with Pharaoh. But Pharaoh has died. That generation has passed. And that's where we pick up in Exodus chapter 1. Now it says, these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt, every man and his household came with Jacob. And so it's going to run through the names of the sons of Jacob. And it says, all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. But Joseph died and all his brethren with him and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful and they increased abundantly. Now, when it says they increased abundantly, friends, that is no light statement. Most theologians tell us by this time, by the time that Moses comes to Pharaoh and tells him to let his people go, there's over a million people of God that are living in the land and the surrounding areas of Egypt. And so it says the children of Israel were fruitful and they increased abundantly and they multiplied and they waxed exceeding mighty and the land was filled with them. And so within several hundred years, they went from 70 to literally over a million. And there arose in Egypt a new king, and he did not know Joseph. Therefore, he did not favor the people of God who lived among the Egyptians. And the Egyptians already looked down upon them because the majority of them are shepherds. And in the Egyptians' eyes, those people are an abomination. So they already look less upon them. And the new king, Pharaoh, says unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. They literally outnumber the Egyptians. So let us deal wisely, unless they multiply, and in time they will create war and overtake us. They may even join our enemies and fight against us. And so for some reason... It had not been passed on of the relationship that Egypt had with the people of God and the people of God had with Egypt. And so this new king fears the people of God and therefore he is going to make slaves of them, which is going to be the fulfillment of what God told Abram in his dream some 400 years ago. So in verse 11, the Egyptians set over the people of God 
taskmasters, and they afflicted them with their burdens, with their work, with their labor. And the people of God built for Pharaoh treasure cities, namely Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted the people of God, the more they multiplied and the more they grew. And so the Egyptians were grieved because of the children of Israel. Well, the Egyptians pressed hard against the people of Israel and made them serve them with much rigor. And because they pressed so hard against them, the people of God's lives were bitter. They were under hard bondage. They worked with mortar and brick and all manner of service in the field. And the king of Egypt, seeing how quickly they are multiplying, spoke to the midwives for the Hebrews, and he told them to kill all the newborn males, but the daughters he could keep alive. Now, again, we have to look behind the scenes here because a promised male has been promised all the way back in Genesis 3.15 to come and not only save God's people, but to undo what Satan had done. And so Satan is on the lookout for this male. And as we see so many times through the Bible, it, it's always the male children that are being attacked and killed. And this may be one way that Satan is trying to divert the plan of God. But notice in verse 17, it says, The midwives feared Yahweh, and they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them but they saved the men children alive. Well, the king of Egypt obviously noticed this, so he calls the midwives and says unto them, why have you done this thing? Did you not understand what my order was? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women. They are lively and they are delivered ere midwives come in unto them. And so basically they're saying, before we even arrive to do our service, the women have already had their children. And even though this is a lie, in fearing God and honoring God and not killing the male children, God dealt well with the midwives and the people began to multiply and they waxed very mighty. Now chapter two begins by telling us there was a man of the house of Levi, one of the tribes of Israel, and he took a wife of the daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw them that he was a goodly child, she hid him for three months. When she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, daubed it with slime and wild pitch, put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. So she puts the baby in a basket and she sets it in the water. Now the baby's sister stood afar off to see what would be done unto him. And as the basket floated down the river, the daughter of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the river side. And when she saw the basket, she told her maids to fetch it. And when she opened it, she saw the child and the baby wept. And this touched her heart. She had compassion on him. And she said to herself, this is one of the Hebrews' children. He is a male. My father has commanded that all the male children be killed. But because I have pity on this child, I will take him unto myself. Once again, we see the providential hand of God working behind the scenes to bring his plan to 100% completion. Well, the sister standing afar off watching all of this take place says unto Pharaoh's daughter, shall I call for you a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child? And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her in verse nine, yes, do this, take this child away and nurse it for me. Obviously she's not pregnant, so she can't feed the child from her breast, but the daughter is going to take the baby back to his own mother and there he will be nursed. And not only will the baby spend his earliest days with his own mother, not only will he escape the hand of Pharaoh, but the mother will be paid wages for taking care of the baby. And so the woman did take the child and she nursed it and the child grew. And she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And this means drawn out of water. 
Now, theologians believe that Moses was somewhere between the ages of three and six years old when he was returned unto Pharaoh's daughter. And so this would be plenty of time for the mother to instill godly values within the baby, instill his heritage within him, so that even though he grows up in Pharaoh's court, in the courts of Egypt, as a child of the Egyptian king, he will always know that truly he is a Hebrew. And this is very important, as you will see later in the story. Now, it came to pass in verse 11, when Moses was grown, he went among his people. He walked among the slaves, and he saw their burdens. And he was also witness to an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, mistreating one of his brethren, one of his flesh and blood. And he remembering that he was a Hebrew, this didn't set well with him. And so the Bible says in verse 12, he looked this way, he looked that way. And when he saw no one was looking, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Well, the next day, as he walked among the Hebrews, he saw two Hebrews that were fighting against each other. And so he said to one of the Hebrews, why do you smite your fellow? Why do you fight with your brothers? But they said unto him, who made thee a prince and judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you did the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. Now in Acts chapter 7, verse 25, it says Moses supposed that his Hebrew brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. And notice it says by his hand. In other words, Moses sought to deliver the people by his own strength, but that was never God's intention. His intention was to deliver the people that he might be glorified, not that Moses would be glorified. And yet, because now the Hebrews, his brethren, are turning against him, and this thing is known, Moses feared that Pharaoh would kill him for what he had done. And of course, he was right. In verse 15, it says, when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Median, and he sat down by a well. Now, I want to pause here and consider an idea. Moses has been raised in the court of Pharaoh, in the house of the king of Egypt. And so it would be obvious for us to assume that he was pampered, that he had all a man could want at his fingertips. He was royalty, and he enjoyed all the benefits that came with that. And yet now he's going to leave every bit of that behind venture into the wilderness and spend the next 40 years of his life as a shepherd, living in the most simple of ways. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, it says, Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than all the treasures that were in Egypt. Now, there is a great lesson here that you and I need to learn as well, because the Bible tells us to deny ourselves, turn our back on the things of this world, the pleasures of this world, the cares of this world, and pursue the kingdom of God. And so we too have a choice to make. Are we going to enjoy the pleasure of sin for the moment, selling our souls and casting away our eternal security, or are we going to count all things lost for the sake of Christ? Many of the things that Moses once had, now he no longer enjoys because he is a shepherd in the wilderness. And as you and I pursue holiness, what is it that we once enjoyed that we no longer allow ourselves to because we too are pursuing the kingdom? That's an important question, friends, that we should consider much. And that's what we can take from this story today. Well, this portion of the story is going to close as Moses sits down by this well. Moses meets this young woman called Zipporah. He marries her. He's invited to spend the rest of his days with the family. He has a son named Gershom. 
And throughout this process of time in verse 23, it says the king of Egypt died. And the children of Israel, they sighed by reason of the bondage that they were under. And in their misery, as their prayers ascended to heaven, God heard their groaning in verse 24. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel in their suffering, and he had respect unto them. And now God is going to begin to act out his plan to deliver his people. And that's where we'll pick up the next time we're together. But for this morning, I want to revisit the idea one more time that God has called us to forsake the pleasures of this world, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, an image of suffering, and follow him. And I think it's fair to say that for many of us, we know very little of suffering because in all rights compared to two-thirds of the world that are truly living in extreme poverty, we are a pampered people. And the Bible is full of warning, even in Jesus' teaching, that we must be very careful how much we allow the world to attach itself to us and we become a participant in the things of this world. And that's what Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, when he's explaining the parable of the sower. And he says, some seed fell by the thorns. He says in verse 22, the thorns is the one that hears the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. Notice the cares of this world, the pleasures of this life, the deceitfulness of riches choke the word of God. Mark chapter four, verse 19 puts it this way. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, And the lusts or the desires of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Luke chapter 8 verse 14 says, That which fell among thorns are they which have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And they bring no fruit to perfection. And so the Bible is very clear on how we as God's people are to be aware and alert to the fact that we do not allow ourselves to become participants in the entertainment, the pleasures, the cares of this world. We are to sacrifice those things. And so I pray and encourage that you will give much attention to these passages, friends, and that you will see them as warning signs as you continue on in your journey. You know, today is a day where hundreds of millions of people are going to come together and they're going to watch the Stupor Bowl. They're going to sit in front of a box, an electronic box, and they're going to become stupefied by what they watch on that box. But how different this world would be if those hundreds of millions of people, instead of watching that program on the television, would give themselves to prayer would give themselves to Bible study. And a great majority of those hundreds of millions are going to consider themselves Christ's people. And yet they are breaking the very command which he gave. We must not give ourselves to the cares of this world, the pleasures of this life. Instead, we must give ourselves to the more simple things in life, caring for others, loving others, serving others, staying in constant fellowship with God through prayer, and giving ourselves to the reading and study of his word. That is our call, friends. I pray that you know that to be true in your hearts. And I pray that if you had plans to watch the Super Bowl on this day, that you'll turn the TV off, open your Bible, and learn of the wonderful things that God would have you to know that will better equip you to continue on in your journey as you seek to serve faithfully the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I love you, friends. I'm here to tell you the truth. And I know sometimes the truth doesn't sit well with us, but regardless, it's still the truth. The question is, will you deny yourself? Will you give up the pleasures of this world? Will you seek and follow Jesus with absolute 100% commitment? I trust that you will, friend, and I pray that in some small way, 
in this time together today, that this would be a motivation and an encouragement in helping you to do so. Now, as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit so wills, I truly love you, friends. I'll see you on the next video.